O Lord my God, in thee I do put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is no one to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, or if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread it down upon my life on the earth and lay my honor to the dust, Selah. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger and lift up thyself because of the rage against mine enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. Which, really, you can't have it one without the other. You can't say, beat my enemies if you're steeped in sin. Rather, cleanse yourself of the sin and then beseech God to beat your enemies. Because I've tried it the other way, and guess what? It just really doesn't work. You know, it's sort of like if you're going to go to the altar of God and you have, as Jesus said, a dispute with your brother and you've had words and you've had F you, F you, F you, I'll kill you, blah, blah, blah. And you stole from, you know, and it's troubled and it's unsettled and both are believers. Then settle that dispute before coming to the Lord with your sacrifice and your oblations and your, you know, in other words, with your prayers and your requests. Settle those things that are out of order before you come to the Lord and say, Lord, please kill my enemies because they are bad people and they're trying to kill me just because I'm with you. And the whole thing disturbs me to the point where I think I'll, you know, I mean, I'm covered because I'm covered with the blood of Christ. So I'm, a season of sin for me is no problem. Uh, I'll just go ahead and get, um, and, and do whatever, you know, and, and it, it, but I still ask you to, you kill my enemies. I wouldn't be so anxious. I wouldn't have to slam a few drinks at the end of the day or do this or do that or whatever kind of way you ain't well. When you're anxious, when you're upset, you know, when you're not grounded, the, the, it's like you're, you're a computer, you're an electrical system. You will look for a way to ground it. In other words, sin is simply the way that we ground the machine. The machine, it's like if we are computers, you know, just like, um, uh, like a machine has to have a ground. Uh, sin is a, is a way that people ground. In other words, what do we do? We go to the bar after work, right? We sit there at the bar. We get a few drinks with everybody else, start looking at the pretty girls, <laughs> or rather the girls start looking prettier. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we stumble home. Okay, all right, fine. The, the, the point is what you're doing there is you're grounding the anxiety needs a place to go. You know, uh, people get together, they have um, mindless sex because the circuit has to be grounded. So they do that. They go out to the racetrack and they bet more money than they have or money they should be bringing home to put on the table for food for their family. But guess what? They're at the racetrack playing the ponies because this time they're going to win. But what are they really doing? They're grounding that circuit that has to be grounded. What is sin then? It grounds our anxiety because the gambling is due to anxiety. Drinking is due to anxiety. Sexing is due to anxiety. And, well, let me not leave the big one out. Criminality. Criminality is the same rush. It grounds that circuit. It's doing something illegal and the adrenaline rush of getting away with it 
completely relaxes people. Same with being a daredevil. It's the same, it's the same impulse again and again, whether it's, uh, like I say, the, the corner bar, lust, or pornography on the internet, criminality, um, lying, you know, another way they do it is the Satanists will have learned to be really nice to people that they're supposed to love while stabbing them in the back and that stabbing them in the back is sin. What that does is it grounds that same thing. They get addicted to it. They do it over and over and then they'll beseech the Lord while they're doing their next victim in to protect them from their enemies. And in Psalm 7 here, it's saying, judge me, O Lord, search out my iniquities. If I have done something to cause another to stumble, you know, let my soul be torn to pieces. In other words, you know, let me not come to you unless I have some kind of righteousness and some kind of, you know, a putting down of the flesh and, and have something that will stand up before you as good. In other words, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity. So if I have integrity and in everything I said, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just uh, kind of recovering from this horrible, you know, mega flu or whatever it was. I'm definitely on the upswing, but it's been hard. I've been bedridden for days. Even last night, my bed is a pile of water from sweat. But, you know, I don't know how I got it. I guess I got run down. Got run down because why? Got run down because I'm not um, heeding the call of the Lord. Or maybe because I am working on health, whatever. I, I tend to ask the Lord every day, what, which way? At the same time, I recognize I have sin patterns and weaknesses that I don't like. And I've asked the Lord again and again, take those away from me, Lord. At least I'm asking you to take those away from me. Please, Lord, take those away from me, Lord, because I, I really don't want to sin. I want to be perfect as you are perfect, O oh Father. And the thing is, is that I fail again because what I have failed to recognize is that what sin is doing, and I'm talking about, you know, anything that's <clears throat> destructive to your body, to the temple, eating habits, anything like that. Eating, excessive eating, junk food eating, just the same as alcohol imbibing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, you know... It doesn't have to be a huge sin. It can just be the sin of not taking care of the body as the temple, not being appreciative of having life. Having a bad attitude is the same thing. It helps to calm us down when we rag on other people, when we gossip about other people. It tends to, yes, it makes us come into a sense of family when we have something really to complain about. But I'm telling you that the reason you're doing that isn't because of the thing you're complaining about. It is because the anxiety of life is grounded when there is something to complain about. The anxiety of life is put in its place when there is something to complain about, when there is something to gossip about, when there is something to, uh, how should I say, um, get together with other people and discuss because people in groups tend to be a ground and usually they'll find a scapegoat because if you're in a group and you find a scapegoat, then everyone gets a grounding switch. When the Satanists get together, you know, the witches are fully aware of all this and they use this to their advantage. Um, but this is a principle of life. The same way that energy is exchanged between people and people get by on that, and the ones who are on the dark side have learned to use that energy exchange because they're dead. In other words, I'm twice born, but they would be once they would be dead and embracing death and possibly even flirting with the second death 
when they learn to use death and destruction of others as a mode of grounding themselves and boosting themselves. You ever seen it when you got one person that's really skinny and everyone else around them is fat? And they always tend to be, you know, usually a female, but they always tend to be feeding everybody, right? Making sure that they're, and feeding them things they shouldn't be eating for their health. Causing them to have food addictions while they go on and they go, I just don't know why I'm so skinny. I just, I eat. And that there is another form of torture. That there is another form of a person learning to use the witchcraft and the power over other people could be because the people that are fat around that person, they don't suspect that that person's doing it. That would be the last person they would suspect. So you see the hosts all have a parasite and they don't even know it. And the parasite is feeding off them. And what's happening to the parasite? Well, the parasite is getting grounded. In other words, there's a ground, i.e. the fat people for her to go i.e. The, the skinny one, as in the way of the world, uh, as a place for her to go, because what's happening is that um, ritual that's going on, that dance of destruction that's going on, is um, a ritual that then grounds it. In other words, when the people become Satanists, they break on through the other side. Remember in high school when people, when you've seen people that break bus through the other side, they get real skinny and cool and wear shades and, and talk different. And, you know, they just suddenly go through a whole change. It's because on a wider scale, everybody is their ground. They're getting by on everybody. In other words, all that energy exchange between people, they now have on their side. They're going to use it to shed the weight, shed the uncoolness, shed the lack of playing great lead guitar, whatever, to be popular and become very popular and the people around that are making them popular have no idea that they're being used. That the best ones at that game, the real predators, and that's what they are, psychopathic predators, have learned to use other people to ground. It's the same mode as criminality. In other words, you do crime and you're making everybody else pay and you're ripping off everybody else or ripping off the system. And what's really happening is um, that you are grounding that thing in you that needs to be grounded. Sin is that grounding uh, force. It doesn't matter what form it takes, whether it's a personal addiction or whether it's a psychopathic connection where you have people that um, have mastered this art of deception and learned to be amongst the lambs as a wolf and learned to feed off them without being detected, you understand? And so that then does the exact same thing as what the criminal gets and what the 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 the, uh, the online pornography guy gets, and what the uh, what the uh, obese person gets, and what the you know the gambler gets, and what the drunk gets, and what everybody gets is the same thing. We all have to ground that. It, it, there's got to be a place for it to go. Man has said, "Come into our circles of shame," and that becomes the, you know a collective ground, which is approved of by society as a place for it to go while everybody else suffers. That's why in Hollywood you see everybody looking so thin and rich and healthy and so forth, but most of that's an illusion. It's Dorian Gray, right? They made a deal with the devil. So they get older and they go, oh, look, they still look good. But you see, that thing is going on. Or they would be victims of others. So you too could be a victim of someone else trying to ground through you trying to use you to ground in. And you could rebel against that, i.e. find someone else to ground through. In other words, you know, what goes around comes around. You find another person to abuse. Or, um, and I mean in a way that's not detected, that's playing the game. And of course that winds up a uh, disaster for those who play it. They go straight to, well, if, if, if it were the East, you would have the realm of 10,000 hells. Ignorance begets ignorance. But a lot of these people, their wills are engaged. 
and they know what they do. It's not like they don't know what they do. They may not know why they're doing it. I'm telling you why. The why is because I'm showing you how sin is baked into the cake. There's nothing that we can do to avoid sin except this position in Christ which sets us free because we have built into our flesh a need for that copper wire to go to the ground, okay, for you electricians. We need to have, oh, I don't know if it's a copper wire, but some wire, some ground wire. Without that ground wire, the electricity is unstable. People feel out of sorts. They don't feel connected. They don't feel they have a sense of belonging. They don't feel they belong anywhere. People are strange, as Jim Morrison said, when you're a stranger. They feel like a stranger in a strange land. They feel all out of sorts and put upon by others. They feel gang-stalked and harassed by others. They feel targeted by others, and they are. But it's because the flesh is saying to them, I need to be grounded. You need to find a sin pattern, something that will make me feel okay. You know, it might be reggae music and dubs, you know, and uh, red striped beer. Grooving to the music, everything's fine. But no, it's not fine because you did something to ground it. You know, getting drunk and stoned every day to ground that thing, whatever. Um, you know, say what you will about it. I'm, I'm just trying to point out the inextricability, uh, the inextricableness if that's a word, of sin as a scientific um, electrical grounding system for existence upon earth. That is my treatise today. That no being on earth escapes this, but they can make a deal with the devil to join the collective that is an instant ground for them so they can shed their troubles into the collective circle and appear, i.e. like Dorian Gray, to be beautiful individuals who got it going on. When in actuality, the people that are the obese, the losers, people that look a mess, they're the ones in the battle putting up the good fight, right? Because the alternative to putting up the good fight or to being a lamb, if you will, I, you know, would be to be in with them. But that's not the only alternative. Back in the day when I was a child, um, oh, I'm just thinking of that guy now. Who was the guy that was in Death Wish? I keep thinking Chuck, go to Chuck Norris, but it's that other guy. Um, oh, his name is, you know, Little Mustache. He did like, you know, I don't know how many sequels of that. But basically it was this. It was about a guy that, um, I'm sorry, you know, it's a senior moment here. It's about a guy who, um, his wife is killed, you know, and then he goes on the rampage for vigilantes and sets himself up as a potential victim. You know, it'd be like a guy, you know, today, um, a white guy walking through a black neighborhood at the wrong time of day, you know, with a racial tensions, the way, you know, the racism called for by the president and the attorney general and the Democratic Party and others that they've called for race wars, which is amazing that nobody calls them on that, but it came from on high. The orders came from the president's office himself and, um, you know, that he wants a race war because he can't win the election without dividing or whatever. It's whatever cockamamie. He obviously he doesn't, he's a psychopath. He could care less about people. How many people die in the street just so long as he's elected? That's the kind of, you know, amazing criminal guy you have. But his background is, is classic what I'm talking about. God, who is that guy? I am so sorry. Anyway, death wish. So the guy would go out there and dangle himself like a piece of meat, like an innocent guy. And when the thugs would come up, he'd kill them. So he became a vigilante because, you know, his wife was killed. And when that happened, he became very calm 
and he, he ate nice meals and he listened to classical music and he, he, his life was getting in order now. That now that he's, in other words, he had a place to ground it, i.e. killing people was his connection and the anxiety left him when he engaged in that lifestyle of becoming a vigilante. And it was clear as day what happened. Or just like, um, you know, Adam Sandler in anger management, when he finally kissed the girl before in front of all these people, he got the corner office and he got boosted up and all his troubles went away because he had joined the collective, the world, if you will. And once he did that, the big grounding switch was in, it was permanently affixed, the world is his oyster. God says, you go there, that's the way of death, you will die. And you have no connection to me. I cut you off if you, cut, if you turn that on. Uh, the Bible is very clear on that. It's, there's no way of mistaking the law here. You don't make a pact with the devil in order to uh, appear to be good and then stand before God and say, God, it's like, where have you been? Well, I've been, you know, walking to and fro. No, you've been hanging out with them, haven't you? And I told you not to go there. Yep, you got your grounding switch in so you can appear sinless before men. You really got it going on. You're charitable, soft-spoken. You appreciate life now. You, you look like a, a mess before, but now you're all clean and put together. Everyone respects you, but you have no business with me. Depart from me, I never knew you, and I don't want to know you. I am no respecter of persons, and I not only do not respect you, I don't recognize you. And isn't that a kicker? Doesn't that just ruin the party? People have tried to argue with me over the years that that's not the way it is. Um, it is the way it is. Quite literally, it is the truth. It's the only truth you need to know about this world to be able to make a clear decision on who you are. The people that choose God will, will be, you know, as Jesus going up to Golgotha, a mess. Or like John the Baptist in prison, a mess. Or like Paul being whipped and beaten, a mess. The people that go the other way will be like Caesar and the Roman senators or the senators in America. They look fine. Beyond reproach, right? Nobody would question them. Ah, but they're murderers, yes. And the, the position of their soul comes out when they start calling for race riots. And society that cannot believe that someone would do something like that, the news media looks the other way because they didn't hear that. Yet the result is, from coast to coast, murder because of what the president said. Yet he has no feeling of guilt whatsoever and no connection with the people whatsoever, and he could care less. You know, and the people um, themselves who don't know the truth are easily manipulated by this jackal to the point of being uh, willing automatons to do his bidding and engage in their race riots. Or the, you know, eventually cutting the throats of the rich, there will be violent attacks on rich people uh, because of the president. And he will never be held accountable. In fact, he'll be lauded. He may even have a library, even if he's only in for one term. It's horrible to watch if you're me, if you know, you know, or someone like me who knows the truth. So you really know the dynamics behind everything that's going on. You really understand the, the deep, you know, you have the power of deep reasoning because you're twice born. When you're twice born, you have the ability to reason. And that, that ability can be a very sorrowful thing when you see just how cold and calculated some of these 
belonging to the devil really are because they no longer have emotion like love and anything like that. It's just they become animals, predators. And, you know, they will even prey upon the entire nation. <coughs> and they would need um, willing victims in the nation, in this case Democrats, who will yield themselves in their necks to be slaughtered as lambs. The blood drank by the jackals at the top to create a roving band of zombies across the land, creating race riots and, and death to rich people or perceived rich people for the purpose of bringing about justice and fair play when really it was a way to feed the monkey, the psychopath, the, like the thin girl amidst the fat, the fat family. I don't know what it is. I just can't seem to get thin. I try and try, but she just has no problem. Yeah, because you haven't figured it out. She's the one that's fat. You're thin. You see? But it's reversed because of the mirror and because she knows how to manipulate it. The riddle of existence is hers because she went through to the other side. Yet you think she's a devout Jesus lover. See, I'm talking about everyday evil that's in our families, that's in our, you know, not just national evil. I'm talking about everyday, I'm not even talking about the big things like wars and rumors of wars because it all gets started from this crap, from what I'm talking about here at this, at this intimate level. It all gets started right here at this level, understand? We must ground that anxiety and if we are let loose a free circuit, others will try to use us as a ground for themselves, as a power supply for themselves, and you'll be all the more unwitting about it. You won't even know. And those who resist will look like a mess in society, the bum on the bench. I say no. One needn't be the bum on the bench or make that conclusion. If you join the other side, you become once born, you're once born, and you will be that way forever. You will never know the ways of the spirit or the ways of the kingdom of God. You can talk about it, you can read the Bible, but you'll never be part of it. You'll always be disconnected from it. Going the way of God would make you a, a, um, a sight in the sight of men that would be not very pleasant, but it would be no different than Jesus going through the persecution on the way to Golgotha. Or the feeding of the uh, Christians to the lions and so forth. Why would they feed innocent, simple, peaceful people to the lions? They must have felt threatened because they couldn't, because you know, the, the secret of all this was about to be exposed. The old Rush song, Tom Sawyer, which says, he gets high on you, he gets by on you. That's exactly it. And then they called the whole thing love, the force of love, which is really predatory and evil and about enslaving other people for your bidding because they're all the more unaware because they're not initiated. That makes you a murderer, a usurper of life a destroyer of innocence. One, you know, I'm, and I watch it every day in, in Washington. I watch it every day. Here, here's the president who's a perfect example of a destroyer and a predator uh, feeding upon the Democratic you know, Party, turning them into willing accomplices in his uh, parade of evil, i.e. starting race riots and killing rich people. And amongst other things, I mean, you know, eventually it's confiscation of private property. You know, you know the whole litany of the Communist Manifesto. Eventually it's, you know, kill everyone that owns something. Yeah, there's no end to it with this guy. I've explained to you how evil he is. He's not married to Michelle. They have no connection. It was arranged by Valerie Jarrett. I've looked at the whole history of this thing. This thing is just a Trojan horse. 
This guy is just a complete pathetic little joke. He's an actor. And if people don't get wise to what's going on, then they have decided that they're going to go down so this guy can go up and they're not going to stand in his way because they don't have the balls anymore because America is not America. A guy like that can walk in and take it. Well, then your siblings, your mother, your wife, your husband, your boss, they can come take it from you too and turn you into their slave and turn you into their battery pack. You know, there's a reason I like to live out in New Mexico. And, you know, people say, well, that seems lonely to me. And it's like, well, you know, it may be, but um, I I stay a little bit more out of the fray. I mean, for me, because I'm very uh, engaging with people. And so I tend to get used up real fast and then targeted real fast by predators. So better for me to stay away from people. Because I like people. That's the problem. But, you know, there's always one in every crowd you got to watch out for. But back to the original point, you know, Lord inspect me. Now, those people that would use you like a battery and all that, they're they called the enemy in the Bible. In Psalm 7, they're the enemy. The, um, the need to offer your neck to the enemy to get them to like you and accept you and then to accept their fake acceptance, you know, be reeled in as a lamb to the slaughter, to be heard every time, is a part of your grounding that thing that needs to be grounded, i.e. you want acceptance and love. Well, the Lord is saying to you, if you be a lamb, meaning you're not connected to the world connection, then, um, you know, it's because you're born that way. There's nothing you can really do about it. They say there is, but there really isn't. It's an spe- interspecies thing. Anyway, if you belong to the Lord, then you have to get your love and acceptance from Him, from the Spirit. You can't get it from other people. Does that mean we get it from me, but I mean, I don't live with you. See what I mean? You know, and uh, you're going to have to learn to rely on the Lord more. And you're going to also have to be aware of the need to sin is innate within all of us, whether predator or, or prey. That need to sin is, is just, it's a very, it can be looked at scientifically as the need to ground the electrical um, situation, just like lightning has to strike the earth as a ground, because then there's stability, there's equilibrium. There can't be as long as you're not grounded. So the Lord says, <laughs> the Lord says, you can be grounded in Christ. I, he, he, he is the rock. He can't be breaking up my... I.e., he is the rock of salvation. He is the grounding switch. Jesus, if your eyes are affixed to him, will and is a place for that electrical charge to go. It is a place, but it's not as exciting as robbing a bank, hurting somebody, getting them to riot and cut rich people's throats. Not exciting as getting an Academy Award, which of course to get one of those, you must really be good at the the game. (laughs) It has very little to do with, you know, given you have a certain talent level, It's really not about that anymore, is it? And that's really what we're dealing with. But I'm here not to leave you in the lurch. I'm here to leave you with a solution. And the solution is, you know, it's it's easy to say Christ, stay grounded in the word, stay up in the word. Don't veer from the word will take care of you. And that's all fine and well. You know, um, cling to your guns and religion. Cling to your Bibles, yeah. But basically, it's not something you do. 
if you be in Christ, he grounds you. It's not like you have to work at it. It's just automatic. Is it not? It's just automatic. And you must realize that too much effort goes into self-regard and whether or not you're succeeding in Christ. And of course, while that's going on, you're, you don't even know this entire argument that I've been putting forth, this treatise that I put forth today about grounding, about that we're electrical circuits and we all need to be grounded. You're not even really... Come on, Molly. What is it? Huh? You're not really getting the entire... Uh, how shall I put it? The entire picture when you're mired in the ritual of like one thing and cutting out everything else. To get the only way you could get to the view of what I have of the entire space of reality upon the earth and about circuits and grounding and using and abusing and hosts and parasites is you would have to have your eyes open. You would have to have, um, you'd have to be a twice born thinker. In other words, you'd have to have the power of reasoning and discernment to be able to see that and to articulate it. It would be a power that would come from beyond yourself because we ourselves are pretty much blind and go in circles. This bigger, more scientific picture of the way it works, of the energy exchange that is laughed about by the insiders. Um, you have to understand something. What they have become addicted to and what the <laughs> how they laugh about it is going to kill them. Believe me, I've sat at the bed and I've watched many of them die. Not a pleasant sight because they all have one thing in common. They all reject Jesus. And they go out of their way to say that on their death. And even the most devout Christians, you'll see toward the end, the truth will come out and they'll eventually go that route. It's just unbelievable. But... Um, Yes, secret societies know about what I'm saying, and they initiate them to go ahead and, you know, ground through the society. Them on the inside circle are being fed because they're dead and twice dead. They're being fed by the outer circle, by the outer masses, the dumb masses are feeding them. And that's how people become famous, because how does a person rise up to become famous? He must take advantage and feed on the crowd and get the crowd to want more of the parasitical nature of it and to boost them up. And the power from being boosted up into that kind of popularity uh, can't happen unless there's a connection. The connection is either predator or victim. So hence, most audiences are not fans, but victims of the famous people that they boost, like say the president, they're his victims. He wouldn't be up there unless he had learned how to put a hook in each and every one of them and then ride it out. I hate to think about how these people's lives will end, but it may be something like, Lord, please help me. And there'll be no response because dead is dead. Dead doesn't come back, dead doesn't live, dead is dead. If you go from host to parasite, you're no longer the host. The hosts are the beleaguered people that are struggling and hurting and trying to get through and confused. Most of the masses are confused. They don't know what reality is. And, and that's just the way it is. It's just, you know, a horrible situation. Anyway, that energy exchange and the way people are with it um, caused me to have to say something so that, you know, on the one hand, when you sin, you know, and when I say sin, I mean those things you know are not good for you that you do. You know, eating 
the wrong thing. Drinking 35 beers, you know, uh, snorting coke, um, robbing a bank, you know, all those kind of things that are not part of that collective. And then, of course, there's the collective itself, which I told you, they ground through making the society at large their bitch and preying upon them as a parasite while they themselves are no longer living, they become the famous ones who are dead. They made the choice between death and life and chose death because that would give them comfort. Uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing as the deal with the devil that Dorian Gray made. You know, the story of Dorian Gray, the uh, uh, Oscar Wilde. Who, who wrote that, Trish? I'm sorry, I'm, I've lost all my cultural... Uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. Okay. Because um, that's, a, that's a great metaphor of what I'm saying. Th- what I'm saying has been known by people throughout the ages. I mean, it's not a secret. But it has to be brought into the circle. It was Oscar Wilde, so the Z-Man is not completely senile yet. Hooray. Well, that was a brilliant, um, and Oscar Wilde should know, (laughs) as one who was celebrated by society and um, a man of letters, but also a man, I believe, that had a lot of wisdom about things. I think it was Oscar Wilde that said, your real friends will stab you in the front. (laughs) And I thought, well... So let's hope that, I just, you know, I don't know, but I just don't have, have, my feeling about him is he was not a predator. Anyway, that being said, um, you know, and we don't know. In the end, you know, you're not going to know. All you're going to be able to do is realize that within you there's a need to do the thing that the guy that you're calling the enemy, what he's doing to you, you want to do to him or to somebody else. But instead, you're going to take it out on yourself and drink yourself to death and steal stuff or lie to people or lust it up or, you know, and the reason why is because you've got to ground that thing. Something's going to ground it. So we're fooling ourselves by thinking that sin is just going to clear up through uh, willpower because the thing still needs to be grounded. And what they do is lie to you and they connect uh, in their circles and what happens is they act like, oh, I'm using willpower. And they don't tell you about what they really did to do it. They act like they, they just had the strength on their own. Well, they didn't. But again, if you ground in Christ, which means he is in you, And he guides. It doesn't mean I'm going to read the word a million times. It doesn't mean I'm going to sing a million praise praise songs to the Lord. Because if that was true, the people in the churches would be saved. Salvation then means you belong to him. He belongs to you as one. Nobody else can ground into you. You are no longer a slave or a victim of the world. I know what you're thinking, but you say, yes, but I have that and I've asked him to come into my life, but still I sin. You know, I can't help it. And it's like, no, you can't. It's an electrical circuit. It's got nothing to do with you. It's, it's, it's part of the fall of man and it's a curse that is not capable of, be, capable of being overturned by human strength. Human strength cannot overturn this fundamental way that the human being is made. They they can fool you, a la the picture of Dorian Gray, but they can't, you know, do it on their own. They can borrow from the circle and in so doing appear to be sovereign men and women, but they're not. They're slaves and they're on their way to being twice dead. Permanent death. They're going to use up the goodwill and spend their souls 
in order to be free, to, to be a winner here, when in actuality, they are the loser. Just like I would say Obama and people like that are like the loser. And, you know, you had Bush before him. And, you know, I mean, all the presidents in my lifetime seem to have been in that same circle. So, you know, whether they get it from masonry, secret societies, guilds, whatever, wherever they get it from. You know, the individual becoming part of the collective loses his individuality, hence he's dead. The soul, what God made, is no longer there. The reason they did what they did is because they needed, they couldn't live otherwise. And they needed to ground that thing which needed to be grounded. Now, they want me to be compassionate and embrace them as true brethren. But I would be better off going to the graveyard and digging up a grave and embracing the bones. That technically, scientifically, is what it would be. Oh, you're so cold and heartless, Z. No, I'm just, I can see things other people can't see. You know, and I'm really not a big believer in the collective or in the theory of other people. I don't believe there are other people. I think all there is is I am. And other people are merely an illusion. So I'm here, in other words, to run my race. Not to worry about what everybody else is doing or not doing. I know what they do. I don't trust them because I'm not supposed to. For me not to be used as a grounding switch or connector. For me um, not to keep sinning in the way I don't want to do. As Paul said, I, I do what I shouldn't be doing and I don't do what I should be doing. For me to get over that particular sense of the... And the reason that happens is because, again, Paul needed to ground himself. But the way, the only way I can get out of that is I got to stay true to the Lord, which means I cannot join or take an oath with any guild, with any group, any collective. And I have to not see the collective as real. And I have to recognize that there's a grounding thing within me, that, a force that needs to be grounded. And the only way it's going to be grounded is with sin. I need to transmute that force into positive by being in Christ so that my acts become an extension of God's will, not my own ego. So that the multiplicity becomes singularity and I don't really worry about this one or that one because they don't exist technically in real reality terms. That anything is possible all the time and that our health, empowerment, betterment and all that will be better off without needing to be in this struggle for grounding or being grounded or not being grounded or, you know, judge me, O Lord, before you swipe my enemies, smite my enemies. In other words, I come before you, search me out, O Lord, make sure there's no iniquity in me. Please destroy my enemies. Those people or those things coming against me, you know, or sin coming into my life, please destroy, keep it away. Look at my heart, Lord. Test my integrity first. If I am fraught with sin, i.e., Well, if I'm in Christ, then God will smack it away from me, won't he? If I'm steeped in covetousness, God will smack it away from me. If I'm steeped in uh, lust, God will smack it away from me. And he will continue to be that grounding switch. As Bob Dylan said, you're going to serve somebody. And he's talking about the grounding thing. So you can serve the devil, which means man. And it will look like you got it going on, sort of. You know, your sins will be covered. But you're not fooling anybody because you're still the same person. You're still subject to the law of sin and death that we all are. No, one must be born again. The twice-born see things that the once-born don't see. The once-born have antipathy toward the twice-born. And many of you who are spiritual beings are twice-born from an early age in life. 
and you've noticed you've had persecution from an early age, you've been called a black sheep. And this is because you're, you're a threat, not to anything specifically, but just a threat to the consciousness as it is upon the earth, which is based on suffering. I know of no corner of the earth where suffering is not rampant. So let me take that grounding wire and stick it to you, Jesus. Zzz. Let me disconnect then. Lord, now please protect me from my enemies, you that's within me. Protect me from those who want to use me as a grounding mechanism. In Jesus' name. I don't care where we go, Lord. I don't care how lonely it is. I just want to be with you. I just want to talk to you. Other people can come in and out of my life saying this and saying that, but I want you to guide. Amen. Comes down to the same principle in the end, doesn't it? The sun will set you free and you'll be free indeed. And indeed, that, that what I'm describing is freedom. The worst thing in the world is in families when I see the game being played where there's the one successful person and all the other satellites who, are, who, who seem to not be ne'er-do-wells, who seem not to be able to win. But this person always wins and lords it over the others. Really what's happening is that person is using the others in order for that his or her victory. And acts like, you know, I'm the good one and you're all just bad. They start believing their own press when they're the ones using a, pushing other people down, causing them to do not very well so they can boost themselves. And they learn how to do this. God knows where. It's just part of the flesh. It's innate. And that we must not do. If you want to be free, you cannot do that. Let them have their fame and riches. You can't do that. In the end, God will lift up an honest dealer. God will make wealthy his own, if he chooses to. He will confound the wise with that. Or he will lead you through and provide for you when everyone said you couldn't provide. He'll do that. He'll constantly have you alive in the midst of them when they say, there's no way you could live. And you'll say, but it's me, I'm here. Why don't you believe that God's the one taking care of me? You're not. I couldn't do what you do. Well, somebody's doing it. And thus they see, they become jealous, and then hopefully they will ask about what it's all about. And, you know, God's not shy. If you seek him, he'll, you'll find him. Anyone who seeks truth will find Yeshua. Jesus, but they may not know him by name. They may not know that the conscious person they meet is the creator. You know, they think it's just a collective consciousness where amorphous consciousness in all things just kind of keeps morphing things. And that's, that's not it. God is actually a person and he is no respecter of persons. And um, he exists as a sovereign being. And um, he's responsible for us existing. That's why I go to the source. There is no such thing as self-existence or, or, or you know, as the Buddhists think, um, kind of a uh, uh, codependent origination uh, theory that things just arose, dependent upon one another and became diverse uh, through a force of nature that had nothing to do with a conscious being. Absolutely untrue because, and I, my, my uh, refutation goes to design. If you look in the world, you'll see there's great design. And even in the affairs of men, there's great design. There's a, a mover that moves, you know, that saves us from ourselves again and again, if you will. It's proven to me every day that there is a conscious being named, named Yahweh, or if you like, uh, you know, um, the Almighty or the I Am, and uh, that, that he is in all things, creates all things, and not a thing was made in the, that you see exist without him making it exist. And it's mind-boggling because he's so far beyond and above, and, and, and the diversity of all things is so diverse. 
and so almost incalculable that that we have to kind of anthropomorphize him and you know as a as a like a human person just in order to relate but i mean ultimately it's it's so mind-boggling that you would say that, that it would be a logical thing to say that it's just a codependent origination force that just comes up and is in all things but we're the ones responsible for guiding our own karma if you will and that's not necessarily true um you know, and that, and then in the East would say that there's, you know, past lives at stake that's influencing your, you know, if you have a generational curse or not. It's not necessarily true. There's not a cause and effect that a man can discern. There really isn't. You know, you, you might find out that there's an illness that needs to be treated. You do what you can to treat it, and it doesn't, you know, the cause and effect don't, don't uh, seem to work. You know, there's something else in the spirit going on beyond what what men can see through their through a glass darkly. Anyway, the game on the earth of, of winners and losers, and I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for the winners and the losers because we need to be out of that game of winners and losers and be an object of scorn in order to be saved. And of course, that doesn't seem fair. Um, but they that play the game will make you some sort of object of scorn because you threaten them with the idea that there's something else besides the game. So they denounce you because they don't want to believe there's anything but winners and losers. An eternal struggle of idiocy. Uh, 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 a struggle that is based on vanity and stupidity. They don't want to see that there's anything outside of that. So if you're outside of that, you become an object of scorn because you threaten them. They want to be locked in their little struggle forever. Ignorant is all get out. You know the truth right there. You're cast out from them. You can't be in their circles talking. To, you think that I could be at their cocktail party talking like this? I'm around them from time to time. And, you know, I can't talk. I have to keep my mouth buttoned up. It would only make them uncomfortable and make them mad. Better that they go, oh, well, you're a loser. Well, that's fine. You can think, you know, you can think anything you want. You can think anything you want, but I mean, I'm just a person who knows the truth. And there are very few people that know that. That makes me, you know, the round earth guy in a flat earth society. Therefore, a target. And I've known... Here's the thing about the truth that I know. The truth doesn't change. Truth is consistent. The truth never fails. The truth never loses an argument. The truth consistently comes through again and again. But it's always been the same thing. But those that stand outside the lie are, you know, threatened the whole. So I would tell you this. Um, and I know good people that don't want to deal with any of this stuff. I, I really do. And I don't really want to bother them with it. And it's just kind of an embarrassment of riches. I happen to be very, very um, uh, blessed in terms of knowledge. I have a tremendous amount of knowledge at my disposal and a dangerous amount because I have the keys of, of, of life and death in my little hand. Jesus has given them to me. I can explain the way the matrix is on earth. I can explain the way the game is played between the energy exchangers. I can explain it in scientific terms and what the actual curse entails, the curse of humanity and suffering. I can explain, I, it's just fully clear to me, and it never changes it doesn't need to grow because it's a gestalt it's a whole it's monolithic and it's um there's a deepening of wisdom that can occur of course throughout time as you get older but even someone 100 years old is only is still a baby to me 
They don't know anything. A hundred years is not enough time to know anything. You must get the knowledge from out there, from him, from it, from creator, from father, from Yahweh, from, you know, you must get it. You know, it's available, all the knowledge. But if you exist to become wiser and wiser as you go, you're still a baby at death. The wisest amongst us are still babies at death. So the Lord said, you must be as little children to approach. Don't lose your childhood. Back to the original thing. So if you ask Yahweh to thwart your enemies while you're steeped in sin yourself, better that you would come to the throne upon putting your affairs in order and then make your beseech meant and request known. And that way the Lord will give you the benefit of the doubt and you know you would at least have made the attempt of cleaning yourself in the word or whatever before you approach him and say, you know, this person's really bothering me or, you know, I really worked hard and I, I want this promotion, but I think they're going to come against me and or whatever the concern is. Capisce? Eh? Understand? It's really simple. Our responsibility is to just be true to the one who brung, you know, dance with the one who brung us and, you know, recognize that you you have no chance of overcoming sin on your own. Can, can, you, can, you, can I hear, I got no chance of overcoming sin on my own? Let me hear you say that. <laughs> Just like an old-time preacher. Um, you got no chance. Because it's not even about will. It's about electricity. Sin is electricity. It's a grounding mechanism. It will ground your anxiety. And nobody wants to be anxious. We're all looking for a ground. So sin is it. Built in, it's baked into the cake. Nobody's going to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. And what they do is embrace the cake, right? They cut the cake. They have their party. They have their initiations. The, wrong. Wrong answer. Absolutely false. It appears to work for a while and then fails. You build a how <coughs> excuse me. You build a house on that, you're building a you're building a sand castle at low tide. When the tide comes up, it's gonna take that castle away. Jesus is the rock. You build it on Jesus or you don't build it. Jesus is the truth. You build it on truth or you don't build it. Jesus is not a guy walking around 2,000 years ago. He is, I am. You build it on I am. You know, someone said to me, well, Lao Tzu said these things that Jesus said 500 years before. And I said, yes, because Jesus created Lao Tzu. Well, I didn't say that exactly. I wish I had said that to him. But Jesus created Lao Tzu. Jesus is the creator. He gave Lao Tzu the wisdom because he pre-existed this world. Of course, uh, you know, you can't know that unless the Father shows it to you. You can't know that. You can't come to the Son unless you're drawn. You can't know those things. I mean, that's like a leap. Be, oh, you're just making that up. No, I'm not making that up. He, he showed me that. Anyway, that's the answer. Well, Buddha said this, you know, a long time before. It's like, yeah, because Jesus created Buddha. Well, why would he create Buddha if he wanted to be, have Jesus everywhere? Well, think about the things about Buddha, you know, all the great ethics. You know, basically the Torah, you could find a parallel between the Torah and Buddhism very easily. So, yeah, any good thing, you know, but I'm not going to argue these points. This is like my daddy, your daddy. It's all the same daddy. We all come from the same place. But some people get hung up on this terrestrial thing. And it's like, ah, I don't even come from this world, you know? I'm not even in this world, really. I have a very light footprint here. As someone said to me the other day, well, I said, I'm not connected to anything. I mean, I use things, and I use money, and I use things, and my mode of exchange... And I got it, you know, that, which I don't, not going to be a fool and just let people steal it or, 
you know, be a fool, be an idiot, right? I, I do, I go through, but I don't have money, things, material doesn't excite me like other people that I've met. I will use whatever opportunity comes my way, but I don't feel a sense of uh, attachment. And I don't feel a sense of, in terms of purpose, I feel like, well, you know, some people say you should just give, you know, everything to the poor and follow me. And it's like, I, I'll tell you what I will do. I will do what the Lord tells me every day whether it be a, a word of encouragement, charity, this, that, or the other, as per the way the Lord doles it out through me. And you go ahead and do likewise, and don't bother judging me, and we'll get along just fine. Okay? Then you can keep that straight. Sweat your own fever. Walk your own walk. You spend so much time judging other people, and this is just coming through now, judging me by listening and hearing what I'm saying and making a judgment about every single sentence that you don't even exist, my friend. You're not even here. I see you doing that. You think I don't see? I see everything. I see it all. I'm a blind man who sees. How do you like that? And I see you sitting there going over every sentence saying, Z can't be right. He just can't be. I, this can't be right. I'm going to kill myself if this is right. If he's right, I'm dead. No. If I'm right, you live. You're trying to hold on to this paradigm that is sinking in quicksand every single day and you know it or you wouldn't be listening. The solution is really simple. It doesn't require much from you. It just requires that you embrace the truth in order to be at peace so you can be blessed because this podcast is a total blessing to the entire world and the world knows it. And that's why I think they, they tend to, uh, well, they threw every, well, you know, this last illness I had, I told Trish, I said, someone throw something at me because this was, this was like, I was almost dead. I'm telling you, I, I had a fever so high. You could fry eggs on my forehead. You could fry an egg on my chest. And I was wondering whether I should go to the emergency clinic, but I felt too weak to go. Anyway, I survived it. <laughs> and I couldn't sleep last night. I wanted to sleep in. But I realized that uh, the Lord has, you know, and then I realized, oh, what they intended for evil, the Lord used that for good. I had to be, like I told you yesterday, I had to be stopped. You know, because I was already in a, in a, in a pattern of, kind of a destructive pattern in my own, you know, I was weak, you know, and kind of heading down the wrong path. And, and, um, I was getting some, some, uh, treatment for, uh, yes, I, I go East when it comes to medicine. I go to Chinese medicine every time over the West. Thank you. Next please. <laughs> but getting treatment and I, and I wasn't doing what I should have been doing on this end. In other words, I was getting some, um, you know, going through a whole litany of stuff of killing off parasites and things, you know, <laughs> funny that I should have a parasite problem. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a lot of, what I've talked about, I've been a victim of and, and survive, but yeah, you have to get rid of the parasites in your life or they'll kill you. They'll rob you of all your nutrients, of the good things that were supposed to go to you. They'll take them. Yeah, so there I am getting treated for that, and I'm, and I'm, but I'm not participating. You know, in other words, I'm supposed to be uh, detoxing and things like that and getting my liver detox because, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, the die-off of those bugs goes through the liver, you know. So you want, right? So you've you got to, you know, participate. So I was you know, in my own life, you know, I wasn't lining up with it by being as pure as I could be. As soon as I got out of there, then I'd start eating, drinking, and doing all the things that, that tear down the progress that could have been made. I, you know, 
I don't know why, but anyway, that's all stopped. And so now I've been in this super detox mode and, um, you know, been eating right and had a, had a, you know, a come to Yahweh moment, if you will, of, you know, I've had a little walk in the woods with my father, you know, in my worst, when I couldn't even move and I was bedridden and I'm like, oh my God, what if this doesn't go away? I, I was starting to think, my God, what if I'm here forever and I just die? I'm sorry, Lord, right? There's the repentance part. And, um, you know, you pray for a cure, he sends you the cure, and then you don't participate. You know, it's not good. So, and then I realized, you know, over this time of this, uh, this illness and high fever, uh, I realized that uh, I didn't need the things that I was coveting to a sense of fun you know you get together with other people okay slam a couple stiff drinks eat whatever's on the menu couple bottles of wine and oh boy what fun and then pass out well that obviously um you know it would be fine if for some reason, that was really good for you. In my case, it was like that was the opposite thing I should be doing. But uh, no, I know it's not with me. It's like what I'm calling sin doesn't even sound bad compared to like people strung out on drugs and different things. But I mean, you know, eating the wrong things and um, imbibing and, you know, avoiding and, and, and you know, anesthetizing is uh, not what Yahweh wanted me to do. But, you know, it's like, how can I take it head on? Anyway, with the illness, I took it head on. I'm like... I took it head on and there was no problem. I could have died and there's no problem. So what am I ducking out of the rain for? I don't have any social anxiety because after all, we all come from the same place. It's just that simple. But I don't know. I, I really don't know what the what the answer is. And I'm not condemning people that get together and have, you know, drink and imbibe and eat turkey dinners and stuffing and whatever. You know, go ha- have your feasts, you know. Jesus made uh, even better wine when he had his miracle of wine. They were already drunk and going crazy and he made more wine for them. So, I mean, you know, don't, don't, and they were eating, drinking, giving in marriage, dancing, gorging themselves on exotic delicacies of food. Jesus there dancing among them. Absolutely. Passover, another big feast. Wine, bread, lamb. But we're all called differently. And then there's someone like Daniel, who's like, you know, completely had another... You know, yeah, you walk your walk and I'll walk my walk. But what my insight was, you know, whatever patterns I had in terms of, you know, falling into a rut, it was interrupted by, and I'm not even saying that I was really sinning because I wasn't really, you know, out whooping it up and getting, you know, drunk and disorderly or anything like that. Not, not at all. Just kind of quietly, you know, doing whatever I had to do for comfort. Let's put it that way. And that was my own grounding thing. But that was completely interrupted. And it was anathema to the changes I want to make in my life. So the illness came by and almost kills me. And what it does is stops me in my tracks. It says, this pattern that you've been living, where you have no energy, where you can barely get from point A to point B, where you're overweight to the point where it could be dangerous if you don't start you know, going down the right path, you know, these kind of things are going on. And I never, I found out why I had it overweight because um, of the parasites. They, they force you to be overweight, you know, and it's just like, okay, I got to kill those because the, the weight protects your organs. Yeah, it's really very, very simple to understand. Um, but, but so the Lord's eradicating that. So the, the whole point is you want to do everything in your power to detox from all this and to, to get rid of the parasites so that you can, you can live. 
And, you know, it's okay to be at 6 o'clock in the afternoon by a nice stream or running up, uh, uh, you know, running down an arroyo or heading out to the river or doing something at 6 o'clock at night besides being in a bar. Not, not, there's no bars here, so there's my own bar. But that pattern of, you know, relaxing at the end of the day, uh, that's something that's very... Um, It's very uh, kind of a, well, and it's actually all over the world, isn't it? Like it's five o'clock somewhere. I don't know. I see most people running into those patterns of after work and the anxiety, they go to the bar. Why to ground the anxiety? What happened when, I, when we met with people in LA around the time of my mother's death and, uh, and there were people I had to deal with and all that, what well, we met at the bar had a couple of drinks and went to the restaurant. Had a couple of bottles of wine and all kinds of food that I can't even remember what we ate. I think I had something like Oso Buco and all kinds of stuff. I should be big like Pavarotti, you know. But so, you know, it was just it was just like a standard ritual. No, mind you, I'm not I'm not against feasts. I'm just against it on a daily basis. <laughs> You know, for the purpose of quelling anxiety, the Lord's saying, why are you seeking other gods? Oh, my God. So my routine during the day has been seeking other gods. we got to bust this thing loose. There is no routine, Lord, except the routine you give me. And why do we do that when we get together socially? Because we're insecure. Why should a child of God be insecure? It's just let it all hang out. Because we want the other people to like us. Because we want to get along. Because we want to toast our glass and sing a song. We want to sing about winning the war and marching into battle. You know, like the Germans with their beer and their... And they always would sing wildly throughout the whole bar. Everyone would sing the same song. And we all want that. And then those who take it further, sex, drugs, power, money, are still looking to ground that switch. To, to be very successful with it, the first thing that has to go is the conscience. You can't have no conscience, which that makes you a psycho. One without a conscience or the ability to empathize is, by definition, a psychopath. And those people look for victims to prey upon, and they're, and they're in family. There's the one ne living next door to you. They're everywhere in our society, and that's, you really need to steer clear of those. Don't just go and offer your, lambs. You guys are too busy offering your necks to these people because you want their approval. To hell with that idea. Time now for you to stand on your own two feet and realize that your father loves you. Your creator loves you. That's, go from that position of strength. You know, be weak in him, but that will make you strong under the world. In other words, you have all the love you need. You don't need their approval. Seek him to, to be like what you should be, what you should drink and what you should wear. I had almost forgotten that. Lord, what should I drink? What should I wear? What should I eat? Really? No two servings of Oso Buco and uh, two bottles of wine and uh, a couple of vodka sodas and a big thing of pasta on the side with, oh, with a tremendous dessert that we pretend to split, but I eat the whole thing. <laughs> ah, have a little cognac at the end. And then, of course, pass out obliterated in the bed from um, uh, complete toxification on every level. Then the next day, I have no energy. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. It's just that I'm, I'm just laughing at, uh, I'm laughing at all that. Because I'm just naming what the typical American does. Right? You want to go to the bar. You want to 
drink, converse, feel connected, and stumble home. That's been the pattern that I, my parents did. That's been the pattern I've seen my whole life. There was a friend of my mother's who wanted to see me, and I just couldn't really bear to go, you know, over to his house. It wasn't far from her house. And then, you know, just lie. And I don't want to say the dark side about my mother. You know, just I want to forget about it. You know what I mean? It, it is what it is. You know, she played the game she played. And, you know, I, I don't want to lie to people. I don't want to sit there and go, oh, yeah, she was so great. She was such a wonderful woman. Uh, yeah, I have nothing but great admiration and respect. I mean, you know, she had a side that you could say that about. But then there was another side, the side that I knew. And it was not the side that she showed the public. And, and, and or, or her, some of her friends. And the thing is, it's just like a split. And I, and I just, I couldn't cope. But the first thing he goes is, you know, we start drinking around here about, you know, we, five o'clock, you know, the drinks start flowing. So here's this 85-year-old guy who was like a, you know, I guess he must have really been in, you know, unrequited love. He was in love with my mother, but they never did anything about it. So, but he wanted to start in with the drinks. And I'm like, you know, it was just an automatic thing. And he's from that generation, but it was an automatic thing. That, you know, in order to entice me over to his house, don't worry, the bar's open at 5 o'clock. And so we figure you can get through anything. If the bar's open, you can get along with anybody. And, you know, it's obviously a wealthy guy that, you know, lives in Beverly Hills and has this big mansion or some house or I don't know. But you figure the bar is pretty well stocked. And that was part of the prerequisite. He wanted me to make sure that I knew the bar was flowing. And it's like, you know, that's the last, but technically I knew in my mind, that's the last thing I need. We should take this head on. I don't think you knew her. How can you say that? Don't break my delusion, buddy. Little boy. I've been through the wars. I'm 85. You know, and I was like, I'm sorry, but the familial piety goes out the window at this point. We're brother on brother here. 85 is nothing. 35 is nothing. 105 is nothing. There is no rank the way I see it. The truth is, it is what it is. You don't want to deal with that. You want the bar to be flowing. Okay, fine. Let the bar flow. And we can just start lying to one another so we can get along. And so everyone will be happy. And uh, no, I didn't, I, I, decli I didn't have time to actually go do that, so I, I just avoided it. and Ended up leaving town eventually. You know, um, I made my statement by throwing the funeral and, you know, having this nice crypt side service and having a harp player and having all these people there writing the eulogy myself. And, uh, and then, you know, the Lord just told me don't show up. So I didn't. And they got so, so a couple of people got so mad at that. But it's like, I fulfilled my mother's wishes and gave her the funeral she wanted, but I didn't become the hypocrite and go and, and, and partake. I wrote a eulogy that it was only half the story, a part of the story, a false shading of it for the benefit of mollifying those people, but I couldn't then participate. It was the weirdest thing, the strangest threading of a needle you've ever seen, and yet I did it. And one of the greatest pleasures of my life was not going to that funeral. I think that was, I had more fun with that than, I look at that and just a, a warm glow comes over me. You know, but everything was fulfilled. Everything was, no one was just that. And the people who got angry, those were the ones that the Lord said to watch those. There's only a couple of people who got angry. Those were the ones who were the, who were the betrayers. Because they, they needed you there to feed on you. You took the circuit away. They got mad.
anyway, it's all in the past now. It's all in the past now. All that you can say about it in the end, and all I can say about generational curses in the end, which is what I went through, a generational curse, yeah, they're all dead. That's a, if, if you don't see the seed going on, it's, it's, a, it's a death curse. We reap what we sow, folks. And that's what happened. And, you know, I may not have been the one that did a lot of bad things to, to become, you know, rich, powerful, and successful. But the, those sins were visited upon me in the form of a curse. And, uh, and on my brother, who's no longer here. And that's un I, I'm a living witness of that. And I'm here to say, repent. Oh, the curse is now broken, and it's over. The payment's been made. It's, you know, enough already. The Lord has pulled it, you know, just like the curse on Job. It, you know, went a certain period of time, and then it was lifted. But it was like, you know, um, pure pain, pure suffering. There is no shortcut, folks. When you see them in Washington living it up and imbibing in those parties they have and all the caviar and the champagne and the and you can just imagine, you know, what I've talked about, it's almost a joke compared to them. Well, the thing is, is in the end, you know, if they took those shortcuts and other people had to suffer so that they could be boosted, if people had to lose their lives to prevent stories coming out that would incriminate the principles like Obama then you must pray for Obama because you have to understand his fate is sealed. His children have been cursed. Um, and the same thing with Clinton. His children, same thing with Bush. He's got the daughters and then, you know, they all seem to be mind controlled and going on to the next generation and just doing what they're programmed to do. But at some point, they, for their success, if they did anything untoward, for that success, or if other people did for them dirty business so that they could continue in their success, then that will be visited upon their daughters. You know, because they all, I don't think any of them have sons. I mean, Clinton had Chelsea, right? Bush had uh, Jenna and, and uh, the two daughters. I don't I forget the other one's name. And, and Obama had uh, Sasha and Malia. Okay. So the sins of them, if they do any, will be visited upon not just the daughters as children growing up, but their children. And if you want to know if they did anything untoward, look at the grandchildren and you'll be able to see if there was a generational curse. You know, in a sense, it's moot because we're all cursed. We all have generational curses. But uh, in my case, I went through it and, and saw it came to an end. I used to tell Trish, why does this thing go on like that? I used to ask the Lord, please take this off me. It was like, nope, it wasn't going to come off until the time for it to come off. He would strengthen me to survive it, but it was not going to be gone until the Lord had preordained it to come off. I have the curse of the flesh, sickness, infirmity, um, sin, bad habits. I have the curse of this already like everybody else. But the generational thing is like an additional. Now, my brother Rick, he never, you know, there is no way that, that he knew that he was being cursed he never really grew up. He kind of died as a child, a man-child. And the curse just broke him into a million pieces. And he had no idea. He was just a, a sacrificial lamb. But, a, you know, and again, the selfishness of the older generations provided that Rick would suffer. I see the mathematics and the geometry behind each and every cause and effect. Every kind of negative cause is answered with a negative effect. Positive causes get positive effect. We reap what we sow absolutely in the East, in the West. It's beyond religion. It's a truth of life. But there are certain circles in our society, like the Masonic circles and so forth, that think they can beat that by doing good works to counter that curse of them having to do dirty work to get 
you know, people elected and things done. You know how it is to run a city. There's a certain amount of dead bodies that wind up here and there. And, you know, they feel they can cover that up with good works. Assuming that, you know, these societies have control of our society. And, and the thing I have to tell them is, well, you can obviously see by the United States of America that all your good works have done about nothing to cure this generational curse that we, as United States citizens, are in right now. So your paradigm doesn't work. Your knowledge, Masons, isn't the same or as good as my knowledge. You should listen to me then, which is really like listening to God. I mean, not me, but you, you know what I mean, what's coming through me. Not me, the flawed me, but when it's coming through, good, then you should listen to that. When it rings of truth, hearken to that. You can discard the rest. And reform, repent, renounce, de-oath. Renounce your oaths. Do not take oaths unto men. Just an oath before God. If we all do that, we'll be good to each other. If we don't, we're going to war with each other. That's just the way it is. And I'm done talking to you. I bid you shalom, shalom. I love you and I'm praying for you. And we don't know when we'll strike again. It's been, oh, it's, it's been insane lately. You know, my life has not been in order. And, uh, and then the illness just about killed me. And you didn't need to know that. But I once again stared at death. Hello, I love you. Didn't hurt at all. I mean, it hurt, but it didn't really, you know, it wasn't like I was worried. You know. I look forward to the renewal. I, I wasn't worried because this is not the end all and be all for me. You know, this is just a, a passing through. This is just a brief little stop on the way to something, you know, else. And as long as I keep moving, I'm happy. Hey, if in death I don't, I, I'm unconscious of everything, that's fine. If I don't take it with me, that's fine. Don't remember myself as this person in this body doing this. That's fine with me. Life goes on. In whatever form it takes. There is no death. See you next time.